From the lab to your ears, you're listening to Wonder Labs. Hello, and welcome to Wonder Labs. This is Chris Richardson checking in from sunny Okinawa, where I've been spending time as a fellow at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, OIST. Today on the show, we speak with Tom Burns. Tom is a computational neuroscientist who replicates brains using computers to understand how they make sense of the world. He does this in part using artificial neural networks, computing systems that are inspired by, although not necessarily identical to, biological neural networks. In this episode, we use some basic neuroscience to explain the firing of signals, or action potentials, in the brain, to explain how it's then possible to understand them as digital signals. We then walk through the evolution of neural networks, beginning back in the 50s, before moving through to some more familiar examples in modern deep learning, and eventually landing on Tom's focus, spiking neural networks. During the conversation, you'll learn about the progress that's been made over the last half a century, and how the technologies are and might be applied to tackle problems in the real world including things like brain-machine interfaces, recently popularised by the likes of Elon Musk. Tom has a rich academic background, and I really wanted to tap into that. He's a philosopher, and also holds a degree in bioethics, which at one point took him to Geneva to help in the battle against the 2015 West African Ebola virus epidemic, the most widespread in history. He brings all of this thinking to his research, including questions on consciousness and what makes us human. Unsurprisingly, he's an advocate for a return to unity between the sciences and philosophy. It's a fascinating but grounded tour through a research area that gets a lot of hype, and I hope it leaves you pondering. Tom Burns. Hi, Chris. Thanks very much for joining us on Wonder Labs today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I thought it might be nice if we began by providing listeners with a little bit of context, some fundamentals of neuroscience, and in particular, the firing of signals within the brain. Yeah, yeah, sure. So we have this big thing between our ears, uh, which is the brain, and, and then we have our nerves, which are going through all the body, right, where we get uh, the signals from our senses. And this all comes into the brain in various ways. There's basically specializations within the brain. For example, there are sensory cortices, these are basically hubs where a particular sensation will be processed. So, for example, the primary visual cortex, which is towards the back of your head, is responsible for vision. And that's where a lot of the information from your eyes go. It also stops by at some other lower level kind of brain areas. But this is the primary area that it goes to in, in what's called your neocortex, which is the most advanced part of the human brain. And you might have even experience growing up if you you know get knocked on the back of the head or if you fall over sometimes you see stars at least on the cartoons they see stars right i think i get it nowadays when i get out of a chair too fast <laughs> <laughs> yeah that can happen too in older age but uh yeah these stars are actually the activation of of your neurons in the primary visual cortex mm. and this flickering is essentially the firing or you could say misfiring of these neurons and and when I say firing the technical term is actually action potential mm -hmm. and this is the kind of an important feature of the nervous system is it has these action potentials which is sort of just like an on-off signal for a neuron and if a signal is on then it has just received an action potential and it will send also an action potential or a signal to the neurons it connects to so these neurons are kind of like relay stations. They receive an action potential and then they send out action potentials to their friends that they're connected to. So literally like participating in a relay. Yeah, yeah, it's a relay race. And actually within each neuron, you have something of a wave of electrical potential, which you could think about at a sporting event. You know, sometimes people make a wave with their bodies like all jumping up and down, right? Mm. So... If you imagine a relay race, actually, where the baton is not passed actually person to person directly, <laughs> but rather through a slow undulating wave of people, such that maybe when one person arrives at one end of the sporting ground, the wave of people stand up and, and go along, 
And then when it reaches the next person in the relay, that person can run along. And the firing is occasionally described as this all or nothing. It's either not firing or it's firing, which you alluded to, which I guess is almost like a computational zero or one. It is. Yeah, it is literally digital. And what's interesting about the brain is that we have these analog signals, kind of like a wave, right? Like the the wave in that analogy of the sporting stadium. That wave is analog, but the actual feature of running or not running is digital. So it's very much that digital property that allows us to transcend or move beyond the physical realm and into what are termed artificial neural networks. Right. And this is your area. Right, yeah. Well, I suppose I would say that my interest is something like computational or theoretical neuroscience, which indeed does use artificial neural networks. But I try to make my artificial networks as biologically realistic as I can. Typically, the field of artificial neural networks have been heavily inspired always from biology. But in the past, they've been perhaps inspired to different degrees, let's say. So the first kind of major step towards our current artificial neural networks was the so-called perceptron. And this is an essentially an accumulator and it makes a binary decision on or off like a neuron. And it's got this analog component in a sense, in the sense that it's accumulating information from different sources. And then it's summing that together. It's weighting the importance of those sources of information. And it's deciding based on all that, Am I going to become active? Am I going to fire, have this action potential, or am I not? So you can get perceptrons to make these kind of binary decisions. For example, is this a cat or is this a dog? You know, something like that. So you might have information about does the creature have a tail? Uh, Well, if it doesn't, it might be neither of these things, right? Is it small? Is it big? Uh, Does it have pointy ears or floppy ears? these features would be weighted with some degree and then would make a binary decision, is it a cat or is it a dog? So that was very much the first generation, if you will, of yeah. these artificial neural networks. Right. What else has kind of happened in the intervening years before we get to where you are now? Yeah, that's right. That is kind of considered by some the first generation of these artificial neural networks. And the, the second generation is maybe a bit more contentious as to exactly what it refers to. Some people might say that it refers to sort of multi-layer perceptrons. So basically, you can think of one perceptron having this digital input-output be weighted, uh, so that is like just multiplied by some real number between 0 and 1. So in the case of 0, but multiplied by any number, it's going to be 0. But if the signal is 1, then you can weight that signal by some number between 0 and 1, let's say 0.5, and then now the signal from this neuron is 0.5, and that can be accumulated into another perceptron. So you could have this kind of network of Mm -hmm. perceptrons, and these are in layers, you know, they're going deeper and deeper. And we get, I guess, along this trend now towards deep learning, and there, there are other sorts, and I should say the perceptron is quite an old artificial neural network and we have much more advanced ones now but uh, fundamentally they're all kind of based on this idea of the perceptron so as we move from that first generation if you will perceptron to these second generation deep learning Mm. the real shift is that these additional layers of processing enable us to move from beyond binary to continuous yeah yeah you can say that also you can say things like uh, let us have more than one output neuron Hmm. you see in in the in the traditional perceptron you just have one single perceptron, right? But in this age of deep learning, you have many perceptrons and many layers, uh, or perceptron-like artificial neurons, I should say, and you can have multiple output neurons. So, for example, in a very classical application, you would take handwritten digits and classify them as, you know, which digit are they, 0 through 9. And to do that, you would have a total of 10 output neurons and you would just say well whichever of these neurons has the the highest activation is the one that the network is guessing so that's a good example to illustrate the distinction and i suppose some of the more complex examples of second generation Mm. deep learning people might be familiar with things like AlphaGo. right yeah AlphaGo is a really good example of maybe one of the greatest so far achievements of deep learning And uh, I think a lot of people should 
know about this if they don't already, but basically AlphaGo beat the world's best player, human player, at this game of Go, which is in some ways way more complicated than chess, way more complicated than... Any other board game that we have. <laughs> yeah, right. Except maybe like some kind of social game like uh, Diplomacy or something. Hmm. There are some games, poker I guess is another example, where there's a lot of deceit and a lot of a lot more psychology which is involved, which AR are getting good at, but in a technical perfect knowledge game like Go, that is there's no knowledge outside of the game that helps you beat the game. But uh, for that style of game, it's the most complicated we know of, and AlphaGo beat the best human player in the world. There were some limitations, though. AlphaGo can only play Go. It can't play chess. <laughs> and also, it uses uh, a lot of power, uh, a lot of resources to actually train it and to run it. Moving away from second generation, then, and perhaps touching on the point you just made about the power that's required to run some of these systems. Mm. Your particular area of interest, spiking neural networks, mm. is considered to be the third generation in this lineage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's different about spiking neural networks versus second gen? Well, I should say maybe not everyone uh, accepts this third generation thing. My uh, interpretation, of course, is that it is the future, but uh, actually more likely it's going to be combined with these second generation, first generation style of things. But uh, yeah, you mentioned the computational power or the uh, power efficiency, I think. And uh, that's exactly the advantage of these spiking neural networks. So earlier we were talking about neuroscience and we are talking about these uh, signals like action potentials, these all or nothing digital signals. Mm -hmm. And really in, in all of the artificial neural networks, which are no doubt inspired by that digital feature and the accumulation of signal, we're not actually setting up these neurons in such a way that they perform like the brain. So actually, the way we always set them up is we set them up in layers, mostly linear kind of layers. And this is very unlike the brain. There are some parts of the brain which have very similar so-called feed-forward networks. That's networks that uh, start in one place and all of their output goes towards some other place like the cerebellum is an example of that. But many other parts of the brain, like the neocortex, the part we were talking about earlier, that's the most advanced part of our human brain, that does not have a, you know, a simple feed-forward structure. It has general structure to it. Indeed, it even has so-called layers. But uh, there's a very complex kind of spider web or spaghetti of neurons. Mm -hmm. And these are signals that are going in all different directions backwards, forwards, sideways, and these spikes or action potentials are sort of generating dynamics and generating patterns in their firing. So if you imagine current deep learning is kind of like a relay race mm -hmm. where you're passing the baton on to the next one and the next one and the next one, in a spiking neural network, you have a thousand people on the field running in all possible directions passing all manners of batons to everyone. Maybe not even batons. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> Probably different colored batons, different shaped things. It's a free-for-all. It's a, it's, it's a free-for-all and it's very, very messy. And actually, we have some basic kinds of understanding about how the brain actually uses such a messy dynamical event or series of events to perform computation. But compared to these second and first generation artificial neural networks, we don't know a whole lot. So the algorithms we have for this third generation are lacking, and that's kind of what I'm working on. So in some sense, I've heard them described as a step back from deep learning, second generation. Mm. I don't necessarily mean that with the negative connotation that you would expect, because it appears that that's part of their charm, part of their power right. lies in that binary simplicity that mm. perhaps lends itself better towards understanding our own minds. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly a step back in terms of their computational power. Right now, deep learning, the second generation, that's performing markedly above spike in neural networks in terms of its ability to learn. But actually, if you take a second generation neural network, 
and perform some kind of transfer into the spiking realm, into this third generation realm, you can get basically the same functionality, generally with a little bit less performance, admittedly, but you can get close to the same performance and you might take up as much as, say, 5 or 10% of the power efficiency. That's not a trivial matter, particularly when we think about the kinds of applications that we might expect to be hinging on these technologies. Right. And if you want an AlphaGo on your phone, you don't want to be carrying around a supercomputing that takes on the order of, you know, uh, kilowatts of power. That is, you know, many thousands of watts, whereas our brain uses far less than 100 watts. You know, some say 10, 12 watts. I mean, other estimates are a bit higher, but it's definitely less than 100 watts. So the human brain is able to operate at a fraction of the cost. Yeah, exactly. And um, just the existence proof of our brains, the fact that our brains exist and are able to do all these things, proves that spiking neural networks, at least the sort that we have in our brains, are very powerful and very efficient computationally. Uh, it could be that we see many more efficiencies in this second generation, and I'm sure we will. But I really think that in order to see the same sorts of efficiencies and functions as our, as our own brains, we need to take more inspiration from biology and neuroscience. And, you know, some people will, on that note, take up the point that, oh, but we didn't mimic birds. And I agree, but then actually a bird is able to fly very long distances with very little power, much less than a typical aeroplane, right? I mean, if you consider the takeoff and, and landing and typical commercial airliners. So I think we ought to look more closely at biology, uh, especially in this case, in, in the case of uh, artificial neural networks. So we sacrifice some of the computational power, but that comes with the benefit of being able to perform the same kind of computing processes at a fraction of the cost in a way that much more closely resembles biology. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's that's pretty spot on. Moving away from the underpinnings of the technology, what about the applications? What applications have we seen so far that have used spiking neural networks? Well, that's a very interesting question because I think there's actually been very few. So there's one which I sort of touched on earlier, and that is take a current deep learning network and chuck it in the spiking realm. Sounds pretty dangerous. But <laughs> right, yeah. But, you know, see, see if you can't get a nice amount of reduction in cost, in your energy cost, and then, you know, maybe you lose some performance, but uh, you'll at least have gained this ability to put it on your smartphone or to, you know, put it on a home computer rather than a supercomputer. So that's one application. But um, I think a, a better application really is trying to create brain-machine interfaces, actually. Hmm. So to interface with our brains, we can use more coarse kind of uh, signals. But if we use more brain-like signals, that might be more successful. Uh, so far, there's been very limited work in that area, but I actually foresee that as being perhaps one of the biggest impacts of spiking networks. So just to take people through that. Yeah, I know many so-called BMIs, brain-machine interfaces, and... Um, they're extremely important. For example, while we can't yet uh, fix someone with paralysis, we can put one of these VMIs in their brain and let them maybe control a robot arm or mm -hmm. some kind of other assistive device or like a wheelchair, that kind of thing. So these things could be hugely benefited by spiking networks. I guess maybe a third application, which is my interest mostly, is in really taking on and going head to head with these traditional second generation networks and taking exactly the same tasks but just trying to do them a lot better. So we can so far do them a lot cheaper with less cost but not yet the same performance. Um, and I'm interested in, in trying to solve that performance gap. So which of the second gen technologies are you taking on? Mostly at the moment memory and navigation is my interest. So there's a lot of work done already in neuroscience on memory and navigation, say in rats and mice and all sorts of animals. And all the data from that is spiking data. That is, you know, data of the neurons having their action potentials on and off. And also data about how these neurons are connected with each other and how they form connections and form spiking behaviours in order to form the behaviour of memories or the behaviour of navigating a maze or something like that. And actually what we in my kind of uh, discipline are trying to do is look at those experiments 
look at the stuff happening in deep learning and seeing, well, actually, how can we do something like what they're doing there in deep learning, but using the knowledge of all this neuroscience that's been done for many, many decades, how can we harness that and create something that basically replicates that behavior with those building blocks, with those sparking neural networks? That's a really interesting problem. And when you solve that problem or, or when you begin to solve that problem, you're actually beginning to also go into how does that biological system actually work? So you're kind of having a, two benefits. You've got the benefit of the application and you've also got the benefit to neuroscience, to understanding the brain. So that's why, for example, I call myself a computational neuroscientist, not an artificial intelligence researcher, because actually I think I'm interested in both of those benefits. In terms of getting to that point then, mm. what are the major challenges or barriers towards getting there? Yeah, well, at the moment, it's just purely a lack of algorithms. So currently in deep learning, for example, we know if we have this input, we can feed it through the network, generate an error, and then use something called backpropagation, which is just a, a way of sort of tweaking all the different knobs in the artificial neural network to move it in a more correct direction. We use this process iteratively and slowly tweak the knobs and fine tune the whole system. And that works quite well. That gets us the performance that we see in deep learning. But in spiking neural networks, we don't have such a algorithm. We have something called Hebbian learning, which is basically if neurons fire together, then their connections become stronger. That's a massive oversimplification, but essentially that's it. So Hebbian learning in that sense is quite good. Uh, because if you have a memory, for example, of activating this neuron, then that neuron, then that neuron because of some sensory perception, then all those neurons get kind of strongly linked together. Mm -hmm. Then if you activate just one of those or a subset of those, then the others will also get activated and then you'll be able to recall the memory. So it's got some definite potential there, at least in a practical sense. Yeah, yeah, and, and also for navigation and also for solving all manner of, of problems that our regular brains do. And what's cool is, of course, we can go to the, the neuroscience and we can say, how are these neurons actually doing it? Because although I said we didn't have an algorithm for doing something like backpropagation in spiking neural networks, we do actually have the existence of our own brains, and that is you know, a combination of algorithms including genetic algorithms, evolution, you know, our own development and our own learning, which is obviously capable of learning these things. So it's a matter of discovery. And that's sort of where I want to turn to next, because beyond the neuroscience and the AI, I know that philosophy is another interest of yours. So what do you anticipate that this line of work might reveal to us about the nature of our own minds? Yeah, philosophy has always been a big interest of mine. And I think that philosophers discount science and scientists discount philosophy sometimes. And I think in the case of uh, spiking neural networks, we actually have a lot to gain by looking at, uh, looking at philosophy of mind. So in the same way as deep learning has been looking at neuroscience more and more and spiking neural network research is looking at neuroscience more and more. Well, naturally it has to actually, but, uh, if all of those researchers are also looking a bit more at philosophy of mind, there's an even deeper and richer history, uh, including psychology and all these other related fields, cognitive science, which we can draw upon for inspiration and for knowledge and wisdom. Though in spiking neural networks, I think that we're probably getting to a point in maybe the next 20 or 30 years where we'll have made some progress in understanding how spiking neural networks actually perform important computations like memory formation, learning and development, and things like this. And that's going to have ramifications for us because right now we can say, oh, but deep learning isn't really like us, <laughs> you know. On a fundamental building block basis, it's, you know, I mean, of course it's silicon and it's metals and all sorts of things, but it's not like us in this computational sense, right? It's not a spiking network. But as soon as it is, the philosopher inside me sort of says, it's becoming really close to, to us, like much closer. And at that point, I think it's going to bring up questions about, well, what makes us human? What makes a consciousness? For example, 
you know, a famous and probably my favourite philosopher uh, from Australia named Peter Singer. I know Peter Singer. So is he the utilitarian? Right, right. So, yeah, he's a utilitarian, which means that he values sort of the outcomes of things and we should value actions based on what's the outcome here, what's the consequence, you know, did we produce a good consequence or a bad consequence? And so I mentioned him because I think that what he has done in the philosophy of animals is really pointed out to us that we were being quite wrong by saying, well, just because an animal, you know, is in the body of an animal that it can't feel or it can't think or it can't experience pain. And really, it's a speciesist argument. That is, we're judging the abilities of another species Mm -hmm. based not on some sort of sensible, say, neuroscientific foundation, but based on species based on its relatedness to humans exactly and so i think all of those arguments related to speciesism and uh, those related kind of ethics could in the future very quickly especially with the development of spiking neural networks be applied to these kind of just these networks as abstract objects um you know if, if i write it down on the whiteboard and manually do the simulation of it does it become alive? <laughs> what about what about if I put it inside a robot and I let the robot's electronics simulate it? Does that somehow make a difference? And I guess I should mention I kind of started my uh, academic life more in kind of an experimental setting and have slowly but surely decided, you know, I'm going to become more and more abstract. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think becoming more abstract is in the nature of being a scientist, though. Becoming more abstract is certainly more intellectually gratifying and perhaps Mm. more useful in terms of the thought experiments it allows you to pose and the problems it allows you to tackle. But at Mm. the same time, what are the dangers of viewing ourselves as merely carrying out these computational functions? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer. (laughs) But I suppose, though, just to ponder that for a moment would be to say that the work that we're doing in, in, in deep learning and spiking neural networks it's all making it more possible to explain ourselves in those terms. That is, as just a bunch of biological cells performing computations. And I suppose it's safe to say that developments in all these areas are going to affect our fundamental society and and how we view ourselves. So you're an advocate for more collaboration in both directions between the sciences and philosophy. Mm. Beyond really interesting pub chat yeah what do you think the major benefits would be from having a scientifically well-versed set of philosophers and a philosophically well-versed set of scientists well i think that really the history of both science and philosophy actually for a long time they were considered basically one and the same Mm -hmm. and i think for me the advantage of having really good scientists who know philosophy and really good philosophers who know science those people are going to have such a greater appreciation for what people are doing just immediately outside their field in science but also for all those people who have done the philosophy work in their area maybe the parallel area of of research the more abstract more theoretical work that philosophy sometimes is and there's a lot of cross-fertilization to be had on both sides i mean philosophy to some extent, is useless if it can't connect to the real world. And science, I think, is also devoid of meaning if we don't connect it with philosophy. And and also, too, not only is science devoid of meaning in some sense, science is kind of theoretically unguided. Really, when, whenever we engage in the discussion section of a scientific paper, we're engaging in some level of argumentation, which is ultimately some kind of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the more that scientists are able to engage with philosophers uh, in their discussions and and in their actual introductions of their papers and and overall kind of in the whole thought process, the whole motivation for doing experimental work or theoretical scientific work, the more you engage with the philosophy, the better the quality that will be because you're drawing upon a wider pool of knowledge and wisdom. So we need to have both kind of collaborating and i guess just (laughs) at a more fundamental level what is completing a phd if not becoming a doctor of philosophy indeed indeed (laughs) yeah so before i let you go we usually wrap up with a quick fire round yeah sure 
Could you explain for us briefly your area of interest? I study how the brain makes sense of the world and try to replicate that in computers. Which emerging field in science or tech are you most excited about? Anything to do with climate change. If you could wave a magic wand mm. and erase a misconception from everybody's collective brains, mm. what would that be? It would be that we only use 10% of our brains. <laughs> Whoever came up with that myth, I, I don't like It's it. a myth? <laughs> it's a myth. It's I feel like most people are walking around using less than 10% of their brains. <laughs> I guarantee you they're using more. They're using more than 10%. That's even more embarrassing. <laughs> Is there a tool that you use in your work that you're particularly fond of? Yeah. I mean, probably a few that I've actually built myself. So programming is a great way of building computational tools and um, I guess math is a tool too right Uh, so those tools are my favorites do you have a science related joke or fact for us well we use more than 10 percent of our brains (laughs) (laughs) really reiterating that message yeah yeah where can people go to find out more about your work well I have a personal website it's tfburns.com tfburns.com yeah Tom Burns, thank you so much. No worries. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for tuning into Wonder Labs. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to subscribe, leave a review, and share it with others who you think might enjoy it. You can also email us at wonderlabspod at gmail.com. This is your host, Chris Richardson. Our brand was designed by Lloyd Preston Allen. And our jingle was produced by T. Fitzgerald at For The Record. You can find more music from For The Record at soundcloud.com forward slash W-E-A-R-E-F-T-R. Special thanks go out to Liliana Labordadosian. We'll see you next time.